Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the International Symposium, but now to the tutorial session. Uh, this will be a tutorial in two parts. Um, and uh, this morning until noon, at least in GMT time. And tomorrow we start a little bit earlier. Uh, let me move on to my slides. I also prepared some slides here. Um, and welcome again to the tutorial part one to intro to quantum computer music. I'm your host, Omar Costa Hamido. Um, this is a uh, um, one of the big projects of the the Q one of the big outputs of the QTune project that is hosted at ICCMR at the University of Plymouth. And uh, as I was saying, I'm Omar Costa Hamido. Um, I'm a, a performer, composer, technologist. I play the saxophone and computer. I did my PhD at the University of California, Irvine in quantum computing and music composition. And I joined the QTune project in last um, July. With me today as co-pilots, um, I have the pleasure to have Paulo Itaburai. Uh, if you'd like to say hi, well, we don't need to replace me, but we can also say, yeah, actually, let me just stop the screen share for uh, a moment so that we can, people can actually see us. And that's Paulo. Hello, and everyone. It's a pleasure. Trying to hide myself. All right, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so hi, I'm Omar uh, here on my <laughs> right, left. I don't. I can never tell. Uh, is Paulo Itaburai is a multimedia artist and a music technologist. Is a, actually a remote visiting researcher, a fellow fellow remote fellow visiting researcher at ICCMR and is part of the QTune project as well. His focus is on um, signal processing with quantum computers. Uh, and he will be presenting some of his work later on. Um, and also with us today, we have Carmen Recio Valcarces. Um, here, can we pin Carmen? Can we? Oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Carmen. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I will be answering questions, all the questions you may have about the IBM Quantum Services. So feel free to use the chat. And yeah, I'm so very excited to be here and learn about quantum music. Thank you. Carmen is uh, the quantum community advocate at IBM. And she's also one of the very first uh, Qiskit advocates when there were only 10 or so. Um, so. Paulo and, and Carmen will be both trying to answer your questions. Um, I see people are using the chat, that's great. Um, but it, in order for us to be able to manage the questions and differentiate when people are just social, socializing, which they sh definitely should do, um, and when they have a, uh, a question that they would like an answer to, um, you should use the Q&A section to ask the questions. Um, so with that said, let me bring back my slides again and share the screen again. All right, so this is the team. And as Eduardo mentioned, um, uh, we have the, uh, we are, this is a, a, the QTune project. The symposium is one of the big out of the QTune project that focus on quantum computer music resources. This is the website for the QTune project you should definitely check out. And I just highlighted a couple things from, from it is that we have, it started in spring 2021, thanks to funding by the QCS hub and uh, the ICCMR that hosts the, the QTune project offers opportunities for postgraduate research in quantum computer music through masters and PhD programs. Today, we will be using uh, the services by IBM Quantum, the IBM Quantum Experience platform that you can access for free at quantum-computing.ibm.com. But we will also be using um, the 
visual programming platform uh, Max MSP. Now it's just Max by a company uh, called Cycling74 that you can download uh, at cycling74.com. And we will also be using just a little bit of Python, just enough to get away with. Um, so uh, I, I love that people already started uh, writing on the chat uh, just at the start, sharing where they're coming from. It's great to see that we have people from France, from Italy, from India, from Germany. Um, and I, I really appreciate everyone um, just typing on the chat box and presenting themselves. But I would like to have, um, for the purpose of this tutorial, um, a, a little bit of a, a more clear idea of uh, what my audience is. Um, so I prepared this uh, little live pool uh, that with two questions on it, it's going to be really quick um, that we can use uh, to just get to know our audience. So you can, if you have a phone, you can uh, scan this QR code or uh, you can uh, open a browser tab and go to menti.com and use that, that code 9503252. Uh, four or five. And once everyone is there, um, we will be able to start uh, getting some, some, some answers. And I see that people are already answering the, the first question. I'll also share the link, the direct link, if you'd like. Let's see, can I copy the link here? Yes. Can I put it on the chat window to everyone? Seems like it. All right. So we, it looks like I'm gonna do some a refresh on the on the page to see the results again. Oh, come on! We just had it a couple a second ago. Come on! All right. So it's there's still answers coming in. We have some people that. Uh, no program only in Max and SP. Uh, the majority only programs in uh, only codes in Python. Uh, there, there are a good good number of you uh, do both. That's great. We have some overachievers here, <laughs> and some uh, do neither, which is totally fine. Uh, you, as long as you're like the doggo, and I love dogs. You're you're all here. You're gonna get. Uh, probably the most uh, out of this symposium. So I, I have to admit that uh, preparing for this um, uh, tutorial was really hard because I, it's, it was impossible to know what the audience would be like. I have one more question for, uh, for you, um, which is, and it's great to ask right at the start of this symposium, which is what comes to mind when uh, you hear the words quantum computer music? So this is a new field, um, and it's it, as as in uh, other similar fields, you know, computer music, music. Um, it uh, oftentimes means different things for 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 people. So I I like to pick your brains and um, see what uh, uh, what you feel that it inspires you. What sparks in in your mind um, some words? I think it's only up to twenty nine characters long. Uh, if you'd like to uh, continue the, the look at your phone or your browser tab, it should have moved on to new, um, a new question. And so I'm going to refresh here and see. Okay, we have some answers coming in. Modern craft work, nice, futuristic, computer, noise. A couple of people said noise. That's interesting. Uh, death, oversell, avant-garde, very good. Quantum, nice <laughs> music, of course. Uh, innovation, nonsense, sci-fi, unknown, future, great. Futurism as, as well, dimensions. Let me refresh to see because there's a couple more answers coming in. All right, so this grew exponentially. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger so that we can see something all right so a lot of people say the word quantum that for obvious reasons synthesis aha very good and innovation and music of course future and new those are the the main words that's um i think this is this is really interesting to have an idea of what you have in mind 
uh, it would be great to have a, a mind map again at the end of the symposium. Perhaps I'll, I'll do one. All right. Thank you so much for uh, answering these questions, uh, this live pool. Let me share with you the plan for today. Um, first, we'll dive into the IBM quantum experience. Then, because uh, there's not, not everyone is familiar with Max MSP, I need to uh, make a quick introduction to Max MSP. Um, then we'll have a break, probably halfway through this uh, tutorial. Then we'll start doing quantum computing in Max. And finally, if we have time, if everything goes well, uh, we'll present uh, the UDP CASM uh, new project. Uh, um, if not, we'll have part two tomorrow. So we'll, we still have plenty of time to do this, this exploration. All right. So IBM Quantum Experience. Um, I want to uh, just jumping into IBM Quantum Experience. I want to state the following. Quantum computing is a probabilistic means of computation that makes use of quantum mechanics phenomena like superposition and entanglement. And nowadays, you don't have to be a physicist or even know quantum mechanics in order to program a quantum computer. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll have this in mind. It's a probabilistic means of computation and you don't need, you don't need to, to have a whole degree in, in physics or, or quantum mechanics to, um, to, to be able to program quantum computers, but there's still something to, to learn in order to make use of it. So we'll just jump right into quantum-computing.ibm.com. And uh, let me ask my co-pilots, um, Paulo and, and Carmen, if you're, if you're receiving questions and there's something that you, you feel like adding, uh, please unmute yourselves and, and add to the mix. Um, uh, and if not, I'm going to just continue. All right. So when we first open uh, quantum-computing.ibm.com, we're faced with this page, real quantum computers right at your fingertips. Okay. So uh, all you need in order to program uh, quantum computers is love. Yes. And uh, an IBM ID account. So what I... What I have to do right now is to log into my account, which is what I will do. Um, and you, if you don't have an IBM ID account, you can easily create one for free. Um, and I insert my password. If it's correct. Great. Welcome, OCH. That's me. All right, and so as soon as we log in, we are faced with these two uh, main options, the IBM Quantum Composer and the IBM Quantum Lab. Um, we can see here on the top left corner, some other options, see the dashboard, some the, the challenges from the Quantum Challenge 2021, the documentation, this is very important. And again, the Composer, the Lab and the services. We'll be coming back to this. Right now, as of, Recent times, uh, the best way to get started with quantum computing is actually to visit the IBM Quantum Composer. So let's start with this. Um, uh, let me create a new blank composer, clean some things around, get some real state here. All right, we don't need that many qubits. All right, so this is what it looks like uh, when it's the, the blanks, uh, when, when you're just starting. We have our circuits and we have here a line for our qubit and another line for our classical bits. Important because we need, we actually need a place to store the information uh, from our quantum bits. All right, and so this is how we program a quantum computer is by writing quantum circuits. With what? With quantum gates. 
And these objects that we see, the squares here that we see at, at the top are different uh, quantum, uh, quantum gates. And they act as logical operators that change the state of the qubits. So I can click and drag this gate here. And I see that this one is an X gate or a NOT gate. And the way it works is that it flips the state of the qubit from zero to one. I'll remove it and you'll see that it was on the zero state. If I had this here, it's predicting right now that if measured, it will measure one. All right. And conversely, if I add another X gate, I'll be able to flip the state of the qubit from one back to zero. All right. There are uh, other types of gates that can put the qubits uh, in a state of superposition, like the Hadamard gate. Now we can see that the qubit is in both the zero and the one state at the same time, with roughly 50-50% probability of measuring zero uh, and, and one. To perform a measurement, um, we need a measurement gate, and we can drag from here. Now we see that we actually measured one. And the way that the IBM Quantum Composer works is that it is simulating one execution at a time. And we can change that uh, simulated execution number uh, here by changing the visualization seed. So if I change uh, the number up, we can see now we measured zero. And if I change again, we measured one, and it will measure one and zero with roughly 50-50% probability. All right. There are other types of gates that allow you to add some parameters, like the Rx gate. Here, I'm going to double click this gate, and it will allow me to add a parameter. I'm going to use pi over 3 as my uh, parameter for the Rx rotation. We can see that. Um, the qubit is in a state of superposition, yes, of zero and one, but because of the parameter that I inserted, it says that it's more likely to measure zero uh, than one. Again, to perform a measurement, we need a measurement gate. And if we had this, you can see that now we measured one, but uh, now we measured zero, and if I change again, it's zero again, and it's more likely to be zero, and sometimes less likely it will measure one. All right. Uh, Omar, sorry yes. to interrupt. Uh, I just saw in the chat that there are some people asking for you to increase the, the zoom from, of my screen just, just to have better view. Let's see if I can do that. How is that? Hopefully that's better. We'll see in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please do interrupt me as when there's questions because I can't see everything at the same time. Thank you. Um, all right. So I'm going to get rid of this and I'll have a new qubit to our circuit. Now we um, have Omar? two. Yes. Uh, yeah, there is a question that I think it's relevant for all viewers. So maybe I will just answer it live. Yes. If it's fine. So, okay. So the question is what is the relation between IBM Quantum and Qiskit? Is the code on the right the equivalent Qiskit code? So um, you can do basically here we have like a graphical composer where you can just drop. Um, the gates, as you see that Omar is doing. Um, but, and the code you are looking at in the, on the right, it's not exactly Qiskit. It's uh, what you see right there that is called Open Quasm. And it's a language that is at a lower level, um, closer to hardware. So how will we program this with Qiskit? You can do anything, Every, everything that Omar is doing with, with the gates and the graphical composer, you can do it also with lines in Qiskit. I don't know if he's gonna show it, 
but Qiskit reminds us more of Python. So maybe you can look at an example later and I'm going to share a link in the in the Q&A section on the a, a tutorial with Qiskit where you where you can see how to build a circuit with it. But this is not exactly Qiskit, it's the lower level uh, programming language that interacts with the quantum computer. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the questions. I see that people are really eager to get uh, learn everything and you'll have plenty of time. I'm also uh, going to touch base on Qiskit and CASM a little bit later on. Um, for now, I'm just trying to go slow because uh, for, there's people, as we've seen on, on a couple of slides uh, ago, there's people with various different uh, um, experience in Python, uh, Max, uh, quantum computing, etc. Um, so I just added a new qubit to our circuit. All right. And we can continue uh, building our circuit with single qubit gates, but we can now use multi qubit gates. Here I'm using a C0 gate. And the way it works is that if the first qubit is one, then it will flip the state of the second qubit. Here, because I flipped the state of the first qubit with the X gate beforehand, at this point it is one and it will flip the state of the second qubit. What we should have is one, one. If Conversely, if we didn't flip the state of the first qubit, then it would be zero. So it will not flip the state of the second qubit and what we should have is zero, zero. But now you ask, you might ask, what if the controlling qubit, the first qubit, is in a state of superposition? Well, what happens now is that we have a more complex state. Um, in, in, in such a way that if the first qubit is zero, then the second qubit will be zero. But if the first qubit is one, then the second qubit will be one. These two qubits are now entangled in such a way that the state of one cannot be independently described from the other. All right, this is our prediction, right? So in order to perform a measurement, we need to add a measurement gate to each of our qubits, actually. So now we can see that we measured one, one in this instance, and sometimes we measure zero, zero with roughly 50-50% probability. All right, IBM Quantum Composer is a great way to get started with quantum computing and explore different quantum gates. But once you want to do real work and integrate with your real creative practice, you might need to use something else. If you navigate to the view menu and open the code editor, we'll see some CASM code at first, or we can change here to Qiskit. This is related to the question. So Qiskit is IBM's quantum computing framework uh, in, in Python. So, if you have Python on your system and you have Qiskit configured, you can use this code to recreate our circuit. In fact, we should definitely do that. I'm gonna copy this for a moment. And I'm not gonna install Python right now on this machine, but I'm gonna use the second other main tool by the IBM Quantum Experience called the Quantum Lab. And because uh, the IBM Quantum Lab is in effect a Python environment in the cloud for free, what? Uh, it takes a little, long, a little longer to load, but do not despair, it does load. And uh, you'll be gifted with a system with uh, eight gigs of memory. Even if your computer has less than that, you'll be <laughs> getting memory for free. And what I'm going to do is close this. Uh, okay, or can't I, I'll just when you when you launch it for the first time, you'll probably be greeted with the launcher, and it allows you to create an empty uh, um, notebook or create a notebook with already some code. A notebook is a 
uh, an interactive Python notebook. It's an interactive way to write Python code. So I'm going to start the uh, Qiskit version 0.32. All right. It's loading. And as soon as it uh, loads, it shows some code. We saw a little asterisk at first there, and now we see a number one. This means that it was executed and it was the first block of code to be executed. In here, we see some import codes to import NumPy, numerical Python. It's a, another library like Qiskit. And then we see uh, some imports from Qiskit. We're importing the quantum circuit, the transpile, the IR, IBM Q. These are different components of Qiskit that will be useful to program uh, a quantum computer. And we also see that we are uh, loading our IBM Q account. More on that later. Um, all right, let me just copy uh, our code here. Great. And we see here that we're importing this again. Um, so uh, it's, it's going to be see first, we are creating a quantum register and calling it QREG. We are creating a classical register and calling it CREG. And then we are creating a circuit that is basically a quantum circuit based, uh, composed of the quantum register and the classical register. Then we have our circuit and we'll add the Hadamard gate, a CX gate, a controlled NOT gate between qubit zero and qubit one, and then the measurement gates between qubit zero and classical bit zero, as well as a measurement gate between qubit one and classical bit one. All right, if we execute this cell, in order to execute it, we have it selected. There's a blue line here and we can click display button here and we see, okay, we have a set of instructions set. So basically a quantum circuit is a set of instructions that we send to the actual quantum computers to change uh, the state of the qubits and perform some calculation. Um, in, in here, we can also do we can also print our circuit, circuit, which is the name that we gave to our circuit, and draw. A shortcut to execute a cell is pressing Shift Enter. I believe this is true both for Mac and Windows. And we see something similar to what we had before. All right. So far, so good. Hopefully, yes. If there's like burning questions. Uh, let me know. All right, I'm gonna create. I'm gonna actually try to run this in a in a simulator. So we're gonna create a new variable called uh, backend, same as in our simulator. And I'm just gonna copy it to be a little bit faster because we're a little behind on time here. Just gonna do it like this. All right. We created a new variable, backhand sim, and we used IR, which is imported at this point. And uh, we retrieve a backhand, which is great. And then we define our job. When we send uh, a task to the quantum computer, we call it a job. And we say that our job is to execute QC, well, not QC, it's called circuit. Our circuit is called circuit in our backhand, which is a simulator for now. And I can already predict that I didn't import execute. So I'm also going to import execute here. All right, we have this here. We have the circuit. And so we're going to execute the circuit on this backhand. Um, we're going to store the results of the job. We're going to call job results and store it in results. And then inside results, we're going to get the counts. We can comment out some sections of our code by adding the, the hashtag. And so it will not run that line. I'm just going to execute this here just to have an idea of what is result. If I type result and execute this, it will show you that the result variable has the, the counts, but a lot more information here. 
Um, so what we actually want is the counts. And in order to do that, we can ask result get counts. All right. So we saw that after running for 1,024 times, we measured 0, 0, uh, 518 of those times and 1,506 uh, times, uh, which is roughly what we predicted, 50-50 uh, probability. All right, so we are at 1030, and I think this is a good introduction to these two components. I'm going to close this window for now. I'm going to go back to my slides make this window a little bit bigger. All right. We have this intro. Uh, because I, uh, I can't assume that everyone knows Max, I have uh, prepared a little uh, a presentation on what Max is. Let me, let me actually put out, pull up my notes here. Okay, let's see, intro to Max now. Hopefully everyone can see uh, the screen well, um, but if not, let me know and we'll work with it. Um, there is a person that has said that um, maybe it would be better if not the three of us could be pinned to the, to the screen because it seems that the code for them is a little bit small. Okay, uh, so. can you un unpin? Maybe you can even unpin me and just have the um, the screen share and not and no one's videos at all. Um, also, if you are on Zoom, uh, I believe you can double the Zoom window to go into full screen mode. Uh, that might make uh, things easier. I I did me and Paulo did try to find a, a good screen share section that would fit well on a uh, regular screen size um, but it exactly it only works well if there's only the screen share and nothing else I believe so Paulo uh, can you I confirm can that it's we're good okay. all right so ignore this window for now or I'll move it away and when we open Max actually where can you get Max you can get Max by visiting uh, cycling 74, um, and uh, there will be a button to download at the top or at the bottom. So where I, the, oh, well, Max 2.0, 8.2, 8.2.1, yes. And you can download for your system. Great. I believe it's kind of safe to say that Max is, has become sort of a lingua franca for computer music. music. Um, it was initially designed for computer music, but it has grown to add so many other components that uh, uh, to include not only MIDI and audio, but also video. Um, so now it's even used a lot by visual artists as well. So it is a visual programming environment for creative artists, musicians and artists, and um, and. And yeah, and that's it. And my short introduction to Max will be the following. As soon as you open it, you might have a patcher window, you can close it, but you'll also have the Max console. This will be where we'll keep an eye on what Max is doing. Um, and in order to start a new patcher window, we can go to the file menu and click new patcher. All right. So in order to start programming Max, you will use uh, some boxes. We'll use boxes and connect these boxes. And you can see that we have several buttons on the top, right, left, and at the bottom. We'll start at the top. We have here this uh, button that says object. If we click and drag it, we will create an object box in our patch. It has a cursor that is waiting for us to insert some something into it. And I'll start by the very basic program that everyone does in every programming language, that is to print a low world. So in order to print a low world, I need some sort of a function that is able to print. And fortunately, Max has a print object. Great. I have a print function, but I don't have the message 
uh, to convey to the print function, which is hello world. If we look at the second object, it is called the message box. In, in front of it, it said M. So that's the shortcut to create a, a message box. If you're, wherever you are with your mouse, if you click M on your keyboard, here you go, you have a message box. And we can see the cursor blinking, waiting for us to type something. I'm gonna type hello world. Great, the cursor is still blinking. So it's still waiting for me to, so if I click somewhere else, it will go away and the message box is now um, confirmed. It has its contents. And if I click and drag, I can move it around. Now, in order for me to send this message to the print uh, object, I need to connect these two. And I do that by hovering my mouse on the outlet of the message box and clicking and dragging into the inlet. All right, we see a little wiggle animation confirming that it's connected. And now I want to send this. So in Max, the objects that we use to, to, to program visually, they also serve as a graphical user interface. But right now, if I click it, I, I, I'm, I'm going to move it. If I double click it, I'm going to change the contents. So there's two modes in Max. There's the editing mode and there's the in, locked mode the, for, for us to interact with the objects. And we can lock our patch um, at the bottom left. There's a padlock. It's now unlocked. And if I click it, now it's locked. Now, if I click this message box, take a look at the console. It prints a low world. All right, great. So uh, we're going to do something a little bit more complex than this. Uh, we're going to say, welcome to uh, tutorial, tutorial session. And I'm not sure if it's going to be session one or two. I'm going to insert a placeholder dollar one. All right. So what I can do now is create a number box. I'm going to go here to the numbers and there's an integer number, a floating number and a signal number. We need just an integer. We can click and drag to our patch. We can connect them by connecting the patch cords. And in order to interact, we're going to lock the patch. Now, if I click the integer number, the little triangle will highlight saying I'm ready to input some numbers. And, and if I insert one on my keyboard and press enter, it sends down the path, the number one, which is the variable that will replace the placeholder on our message box that goes to the print object. And we print it, welcome to tutorial session one. All right, what if I want to add another message uh, to say, um, again, M for message box. And I'm gonna say, today we are learning, learning max. I can connect this and uh, I, want, I don't want to click to two messages. Uh, I want to just send with least amount of effort, send two messages. So maybe I can also connect here and uh, lock the patch. And if I send something here, I'm gonna press one and enter. We're gonna send some uh, information here and here and uh, to, to print. But what we see here is that we printed, today we are learning Max, welcome to tutorial session one. I'm gonna clear the console just to make sure that's what happened. Again, click there, zero. And it's, uh, it printed first the, the message that is on the right. And so this is how Max and many other programming languages work. Uh, code is uh, interpreted from right to left. So if we want to have the welcome message first and then the description of our, our, the, uh, of our session after, we need to change the order of our messages. And for simplicity, I'm gonna just replace here with one, I, we, are, we are sure that it's session one, and I'm gonna use something else to trigger these two messages, a very special object, which is the button B. This button, in effect, all it does, and I can create a new print message just to see what comes out of it, 
is to send a bang message. Bang in Max is a special keyword that means go. All right. And I want these messages, these two messages to just go. I'm going to connect here, connect there. And if I lock the patch and click the bang, I'm going to clear the console first just to make sure that everything is correct. Aha. Now we see, welcome to tutorial session one. Today we are learning Max. Perfect. This is what I wanted, but uh, it doesn't look on, on the patching, on the patch, it doesn't look like what I wanted. So I really want uh, to have this message here because I, I have other plans to, to have things over there. So there's a way to uh, change the order of messages. And there's a really cool object that I use all the time, which is the trigger object. And we, you, you can see that when you start typing on an empty uh, object box, it will say, do you want to create a triangle wave, a uh, strip node, a matrix? No, it's a trigger. And it has a little description. It says, send input to many places. And great. So I need to connect this. And it, again, or it says, if I hover the mouse on the second outlet, it says output order one and output order two on the left inlet. So what I can do is say, send this one first and send that one after. So now if I lock the patch and click the bank, let me clear the console first. We see welcome message first and the description after, even though one is on uh, the left and uh, the order left, right is reverse here. We are controlling the flow of uh, information here. There are other things that will be uh, uh, um, interesting to, to know, which is you can also call trigger uh, just T. That's a sh shorter way to, to call the trigger object. And you can also replace the messages that will go out each uh, outlet. You can send a B as a bang to go, and we can send a message first. So now I can, instead of saying tutorial session one, I'm going to use a placeholder here and say, first message, so it should look something like, welcome to the first tutorial session. Today we are learning Max. Let's confirm, I lock the patch, send it, and here we go. All right, this is one of the sections of Max, which is uh, the, early, the oldest part of Max that was just called Max, <laughs> the Max side of Max. It's uh, just working with messages. There's another part of Max, which is related to working with digital signals, digital audio. And I'll just use for demonstration here a click. Oh, and I need to double check if I share the, the sound. Um, I probably should stop and start share in just a second. Exactly, I forgot share sound. Here, hopefully it will work. All right, we'll use a bank, a button to create a click. And then we will connect this click to the speakers. And we can start a new object called Easy Deck. Audio output on off button. Great. Now, if we connect directly this uh, patch cords, uh, it will go full volume. So we, we need to be careful here, but I wanted to just point out that the patch cords here now look like stripped. It's like black and, and yellow. This is a way to identify the difference between regular messages and signals, audio signals or digital signals. So what I'm going to do first before sending the, sending the click is to scale it down. And to scale, we can actually multiply. And because we're dealing with signals, we will use the tilde after the multiply, and we're gonna multiply by 0.1. You can see that it's click tilde, and all the signal processing objects in Max have a tilde attached to it. So now if I lock the patch, let me connect there as well. Enable audio and send a bang. It should send, and hopefully not, not that loud, or maybe it's way too soft. Uh, I can make it a little bit louder. And 
there's also the possibility that Zoom will think, this is nice, let's get rid of that. So I'm going to use a different object, which is a cycle tilde object. This, uh, and giving it a parameter, uh, an argument that is a frequency number. So let's say 440 hertz. The cycle object, uh, as I said, will create a sinusoidal wave. Can you confirm that you were able to hear that? Paulo? Yes, I can hear that. Thank you. Maybe we can see confirmation from the chat. Yes. People are here. All right. So I connect it and instantly as I connect it, it's on and I need to get rid of the patch cord to stop it. So this is not very uh, um, uh, helpful way to control the on and off of the signal. So what we can actually do is uh, multiply it by zero to turn it off. So let's use another multiply till the object and we'll say whatever the cycle signal is and I'm gonna bring, when you see these little white squares on, on the object boxes, you can click and drag to make it them larger. And I'm gonna send a one or a zero on this side. And a quick way to send a one or a zero is actually to use a toggle box. Uh, shortcut is T. Again, let's print to see what comes out of it. If I lock the patch and send uh, and click it, it prints one when it's on, zero when it's off. That's just what we need. So let's connect here. First it's off and now connect there. Bring these two up. And now I'm gonna lock the patch and just control on and off with this toggle. Okay, that's much easier. But uh, it's just completely on, completely off. I would like to have some sort of an envelope, some sort of a decay. So instead of sending just one or zero, we can actually send a stream of numbers. And the easiest way to do that is by using the line tilde object. What is the tilde here? Gosh, um, this is the UK keyword. I'm not used to it yet. Um, okay, here it is, line tilde object. And by the way, uh, it's hard to know all the messages that each object can, can have. So one uh, thing that I'm doing all the time is to actually look up the help patches. And you can quickly get to the help patch by, of an object by right-clicking an object and say, and choosing open line help. Okay, we see that we can send a number here and it will go to that number immediately but you can also send uh, a, a number that will make it so that it will go to zero in that amount of time. Great. And we can actually do combine these two messages in one single message as a list. So uh, one message there and then uh, the, the other message here. All right. And then we have something interesting here, which is a message that has a comma. So it says, go to zero, and then go to one in 2,000 milliseconds. And that's what happens. All right, this is what we want. Um, I'm going to connect here the line. and going to say, go to one, full volume, and then go to zero in 500 milliseconds. And in order for us to have an idea of what is going on with line, we can use the scope tilde object that will uh, work as an oscilloscope. Let's lock the patch, click this message, and we can see that we created our pleasant uh, uh, sinusoidal uh, note, uh, 440 hertz note. All right, so this is the MSP part of Max. Uh, let me create a comment box. Comment box is here, comment. MSP stands for Max Signal Processing and is the second component of Max. And now the third and last component of Max is Jitter. 
um, that deals with video. All right, so the main jitter object is, I would call, let's say it's the jitter matrix object. And it has a couple attributes and arguments, um, like the dimension of our matrix, we can set a two by two matrix and the number of planes that it can that it can have. Let's start with just one. In order to see a jitter in our patcher, we can use a jit.p window. If we connect them, we see uh, slightly, I think it's blue and black patch cords. I'm not entirely sure. Um, indicating that that's a matrix connection. In order to send our uh, jitter matrix to that the, to the next object, we can use the bank, but right now it's empty. In order to change like the value of one of the cells in this uh, jitter matrix, we can use the message set cell and let's start with cell zero zero, uh, um, column zero, row zero and we'll set the value to 255. All right, uh, a shortcut to locking the patch is clicking command he or on Windows control E. So you don't have to go with the mouse there. I set click, set the cell. And if I output, we see that column zero row zero is now fully white. All right, let's do, for example, uh, column one row one, it's going to be 127. I'm going to lock the patch, set the cell, and bang, and we have a grayish value. We can also have RGB if we have four planes. And now, because we have RGB, we can set, uh, it's actually alpha RGB, the four planes. So if we want a red value, it's the second value. And we will set cell one one as that. Now, if we want to add green on uh, column one, row zero, we can set this value and bank. Now we have green there. And if we want blue, it's the last value. And let's set that as column zero, row zero. Send that message and bank, and we have our lovely matrix. All right, we don't have to create our next block one, one pixel at a time. Uh, we can also use a video and just process it. Here on the left side, we can see some buttons and one of them has video. We have some videos that come uh, with Max and I'm just gonna click and drag the chicken uh, this is my favorite video. So let's see. Cheat.p window to visualize the video on the patcher. I'm going to connect these two boxes, lock. I'm going to enable looping, and I'm going to start. There's a little video with some chickens. I'm going to move this around, get some more screen real estate here. All right, the chickens are coming out of the chicken coop. Perfect. Now, uh, they're coming out because it's daytime, but I, I like to make it darker. So in the middle of these objects, I'll have a jit.op operator object, and the type of operator is going to be a subtraction. So I'm going to grab all the, uh, all the pixels in this video and send it and subtract the values of, of, that, of all those pixels. So again, if I use an integer number here that we saw earlier, we can start um, making it darker. It's starting to reduce this number to all the pixels in all the planes of that video. You know what would be cool is if as we make it darker, we would be able to get the chickens to come back to the chicken coop. And in fact, let's do just that. So uh, let's say if it is 
higher than 33, this value, if it's uh, this amount of dark or, or, or higher, we, we want for the chickens to basically go back to, to the chicken coop. So we create a new object and we want to know, is it higher than 33? I'm gonna connect here. Instead of using the print object, I'm gonna use a message box. On the uh, right inlet, we can set the, the, the content of that message box. And we can see that if, if it's above 33, it says one, if it's below, it says zero. Great. We want that, but we want to, two values. And the two values that we want is to control the rate of the playback. So right now it's going forwards. So the rate is equal, equals one. If we want it to go backwards, then the rate needs to be minus one. So we need uh, this value that right now is zero or one to be zero or, or two, actually minus one and one. So it needs to be two integers apart. So let's just multiply this by two. And uh, I'll use another message box here. And now it's zero or two, that's great. And, but now we need it in the range of uh, minus one and one. So we can simply just subtract and there's a minus object to subtract uh, integers. Um, and now it should be, should return only minus one and one. Great. Uh, so now how do we connect this to the playback? You can see the ELP file. And at some point, I believe there is a message here showing um, oh, set clip. This is what we want, but it's not loop, it's playback. Rate, set clip rate, adjust the playback rate. That's what we want. So set clip two or set clip one, because we only have one clip in our uh, uh, patch here. So we're gonna use a message, set clip one rate, and we don't know what the rate is, so we'll use the placeholder. All right, now we can send this message here. I'm gonna to go to the arrange, uh, is it, where is it? Route patch cards object. Oh, here, I need to click the patch cord and then auto align so that the patch cord is a little bit nicer here. And now let's see, the chickens are, let's see. Oh, actually it's, it's reversed. If it's daylight, they're coming back but if it's nighttime, they're going out. So uh, it, we need to reverse this. So what we can do is actually multiply it by minus one. So now we should have, have it reversed and the way we want. So it's daytime, chickens are coming out. All right, very good. But now it's starting to get darker. And now it's enough dark so that the chickens think it's night and they're coming back to the chicken coop. It's getting darker and darker and it's complete success. This is the last part of uh, my intro to, to Max. Uh, this is the jitter uh, portion of Max and intro to Max. I'll save this patch and I'll be able to I'll make sure to share it with everyone later if you, if you want to, to try this out. And we are about halfway through our session. Let me go back to my slides uh, here. That's the intro to Max. Yes, I know that this was quite a lot to take in. So uh, we should have a five minute break now to get up and drink some water and stretch a little bit. Um, and we will be back at, say, 11.05. Is that a good time? Paulo, Carmen, are you all good? Everyone is good in the good. chat window? Yes? All right. We're officially now on a break. All right, great. I'm glad everyone is enjoying. Thank you so much.
and uh, we're officially over with the break now. And now to continue with the plan, now we will be focusing on, let's see if I have the correct camera on, <laughs> or I should rather have no camera because uh, it would be better to unpin. Yes, thank you, Paulo. All right. So we've been able to uh, use the IBM Quantum Experience, the composer, and a little bit of the Quantum Lab. We've been able to use Max. We've been able to even reverse time to have chickens go back to the chicken coop in Max. So, but we haven't really done quantum computing in a computer music programming environment, uh, Max in this case. So what we'll be seeing now is how to actually go about it. And fortunately for everyone, this is something that is possible to do today. Um, it's, it was something that I was uh, thinking about uh, like eight years ago uh, when I started to, when I discovered there was something called quantum computing and I was uh, a young <laughs> uh, creative artist uh, doing lots of interactive electroacoustic music. And I was like eager to, to learn about this. Um, and really, uh, it it was it was the path that I that I was that it took the side of the path that I was to uh, take from that moment on, in a way. So uh, nowadays we can actually do quantum computing in Max if we had a, a, a package, and we can see that on the left side, a button that says Package Manager. Uh, if we open the package manager, we'll see several different uh, packages and they're ordered by alphabetical order. And if we navigate to the second page under T, we'll see the QAC toolkit by Omar Costa Amido. This is in effect uh, the product of uh, eight years of research and four years of PhD where I was doing other things as well. but. Um, now you can do this, something that I wish existed eight years ago. Now you can have it just by navigating to the package manager and clicking install. And I'm actually going to do this um, with, with you. So uh, once it is installed and sh it should be fairly quick, uh, you can click the launch to launch the, um, to open the, the launcher, the overview patch. All right, I'm going to close this. Um, also, you can, once you install packages, you can always access the launcher, the overview patches by navigating to the extras menu. And you'll see here the QAC toolkit overview. All right. So the QAC toolkit is, uh, the description is abstractions and externals for quantum computing aided composition in Max. So this is where QAC come, really comes from is quantum computing aided composition. And if this sounds slightly familiar, if you, uh, or, or if you heard something similar, it's because you, you definitely heard something similar. Uh, if you're, especially if you've been in the computer music circle, you've been uh, probably heard something like CAC, computer aided composition. So this is uh, by extension, uh, the extension of, of, of that, the quantum computing aided composition, a term that I, coins during my uh, uh, PhD years, similar to QAD, uh, quantum computing aided design, which, which is a, 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 an extension of CAD or CAD uh, that we often see referenced for AutoCAD or other uh, computer aided design software. All right, so this QAC toolkit um, has one main object called OCH.microKISKIT and uh, several different other objects. When we see here uh, in this graphical display, the different uh, quantum gates that we can use with OCH.microKISKIT. And we see if we hover the mouse over one of them, it says click to open Hadamard gate help patch. And so for each of these uh, little gates, there's a help patch to show you um, uh, how to actually create a, a program, uh, a disk, quantum gates using a series of micro -case gate. And you can also see that uh, some gates are only for one qubit, 
uh, and while others are on two lines, meaning that they're four multi-qubits, uh, three lines or four lines, and even more complex gates. There are other uh, utilities to help uh, make the process of building quantum gates a little bit faster and other utilities uh, as well as some examples. If you think that this name sounds familiar, Qiskit is because it is. You've just heard about Qiskit and uh, Osiris Micro Qiskit is uh, very much inspired uh, by the, the Qiskit, uh, uh, the <laughs> quantum computing framework. And uh, it also grew uh, in uh, as as a uh, as as a product or started as a, as a product of in interacting with the Qiskit community. Um, and you see on this tab here that there's very similar several similarities between programming one and the other. But now we can do everything in Max without uh, ever leaving the Max environment. So let's start trying that. All right. Um, so, in order to create one object instance, we can click the M key and start typing. There's like an autocomplete now. It recognizes that this object is installed, and I'm going to click outside. We have our Osiris.microkiskit object. So, the first thing we need is a quantum circuit. And in order to create a quantum circuit and to interact with this object, we need to send in messages. We've seen before that we can click HAM to create a new message. And for a quantum circuit specifically, we need a message starting with quantum circuits. And you see that there's an autocomplete here to make our life a little bit easier. Um, and then we give it a name of a quantum circuit. And we can also set the number of qubits and the number of classical bits. I'm going to set both to two. We're going to connect these two. I'm going to clear this console here, lock the patch, send this message, and OCS of micro get prints to the console saying created circuit zero named QC. Circuit zero because it, it is able to actually hold several multiple circuits, quantum circuits at the same time. All right, we have our circuit. Now, uh, what should we do with it? Um, let's actually go back to the quantum experience, not the quantum lab, but to the composer and let's recreate our circuit from before. Uh, let me put this away. Where did it go? Is it here? Okay, yeah, it's this one. So let's try to recreate this circuit. We have an Adamart gate on qubit zero, then a C0 or CX gate between qubit zero and qubit one, and then two measurement gates. All right, got it. Now, uh, back to the patch. In order to add quantum gates, we need to refer to the quantum circuit by the name we gave it, QC in this case. And now for a Hadamard gate, we type H. It's for qubit zero, so we type zero. We also need other messages for other quantum gates, but I don't want to create multiple messages. So I'm going to use the trick we saw on the line tilde help patch, which is to include multiple messages in one message box by separating them with a comma. So then we need a C0 gate. We start with the quantum circuit name, QC, then CX for C0 between qubit zero and qubit one. Lastly, we also need the measurement gates. Um, here we, we type M for the measurement gate and it's between qubit zero and classical bit zero and another measurement gate between qubit one and classical bit one. All right, it's complete, we'll connect it. We'll lock the patch, send it, and we see that OCH.microkiskit prints to the console confirming that it had the H gate, CX gate, measurement, measurement gate, and measurement gate. Perfect. We have our quantum circuit complete. Now we want to actually simulate it, right? Let's see what we did, just like we did on the quantum lab. In order to do that, um, we need a simulator instance, and we can start one by, again, starting a new message and starting a message with simulator. We give a name to our simulator. I'm going to call it sim. And we pass the, the quantum circuit that we want to pass to the simulator. In our case, it's named QC. And then we can also set the number of shots. Just going to make it faster. Uh, we're going to use 100 shots. Shots is like the number of executions so that um, 
it runs like a hundred times and then it collects the, the results of those hundred times that it ran and then it displays uh, the, the counts. So in order to do that, well, actually let me first log the patch and send this message. And we have here confirmed that it created the simulator uh, named sim. Uh, in order now to get the counts, we need another message. Now we have a simulator named sim and we can call get counts. Perfect. And we will connect here. And by the way, just like any other object in Max, you can right click and show the help patch that shows all the different kinds of messages and gates that you can add to this object, as well as uh, a reference page that has a complete uh, list of all the arguments and all the attributes that you can set and the messages that you can send to this object. We're gonna be looking into the arguments and attributes a little bit later. All right, so I'm gonna clean here the console and uh, and we'll retrieve some counts, but it's gonna both print to the console and send something out. So I'm gonna use a message box here just to see what comes out of here. All right, I'm gonna click it. Are you ready? All right. It says retrieving counts, and then the counts are counts for 00, 49, counts for 11, 51, which is what we were expecting. So this is looking pretty good. Um, great. Uh, and we see that it sends a message starting with counts and then uh, a list as inside uh, uh, quotes. That means it's an entire symbol and not a list in the traditional sense of a max list. So what we can do is add a route object to just print uh, everything after counts. So now everything after counts will uh, be output in this outlet of route. So if we ask to simulate again, we get uh, some similar, but not exactly the same results. Um, all right, and this works really well um, and it's, way faster than uh, the previous state of art of doing of integrating quantum computing with uh, <laughs> with uh, quantum computing frameworks mostly of most of them in python that involved several different things um, and it works natively in max and it's working i've put a lot of a lot of work and effort in into it for working well but it doesn't have to end here we can also um, get this circuit that we've programmed here and send it somewhere else. So if we ask our simulator to give us the equivalent uh, Qiskit code, I'm gonna add a, an extra message to do it, print it on a text box. Text box. Uh, it's gonna open a text editor with the equivalent Qiskit code for our quantum circuit. All right, let's double check this, shall we? I'm actually going to go back to the quantum-computing.ibm.com, not the composer, but the lab. Hopefully it's a little bit faster to load this time. And we are going to um, paste our code that was generated from OCH.microcaskit. All right, is this the, the notebook that we were using? I think so, yeah. So let's use here, I'm gonna comment out all these messages. What is it? No, no. Oh yeah, so for some reason, it's con uh, there's a shortcut. I think it's control. It's the question mark on this keyboard. I it's but I'm using a US keyboard. Anyway, it's, it, you can also do it manually. If anyone knows the, the shortcut for uh, commenting all the lines automatically, please share it in the chat window. I'm just pressing buttons, trying to figure out the shortcuts. Anyway, I'm gonna paste here the code that we generated from- um, It's control uh, slash, I think. Control slash, yes. The same, is it the same for Mac and, and, and Windows? I, I hope so. Okay. Try control slash. Um, all right. Yeah, so maybe on Mac it's command slash. 
But. Yeah, it should be. But for some reason, I think here we, we was control slash. Anyway, we have uh, the, the Qiskit code that was generated by OCH at micro Qiskit. Let's see if it works um, and how it compares. So instead of creating first a quantum register and a classical register, some people were saying this was too small. Let me make this to see if it's better. Um, instead of just creating quantum register and classical register and then bringing the two together, we just have that in one line, um, quantum circuit to two. So that's equivalent to those three lines. And then um, instead of naming our circuit circuits, we named it QC. So it's QC and then we just type the, the qubit number directly instead of saying q reg q the zeroth uh, qubit in the q register. So it's uh, actually uh, more compact and maybe easier to read, actually. Um, so, but let's try this. I don't know if I need to run all the cells again. Uh, it's probably a good idea. Run that and then it's not circuit, now it's named QC. Let's execute that and success. We have the exact same circuit. Um, and now we can even use this to send to a uh, real machine instead of a simulator. Let's see, instead of, well, we can do it here with the simulator first, just to confirm it, the name of the circuit is QC, not circuit, and then here is this seems legit it's what we wanted and now in order to send to a real hardware um we need i'm just gonna copy some code that i've written before so that it's a little bit faster it's very similar but you need to call the provider that we started uh here provider equals ibm load account so one, when you created the IBM ID account, um, you also you were also given some uh, special uh, token, some uh, a unique ID, uh, a unique access to the to the IBM machines, and that's what we are calling here. I'm going to use uh, Manila. That's one of the systems, but you can check on what systems do you have access to by going to. Is it? Do I need to save this first before leaving? Save. Let's see, dashboard. And if you navigate here, it says I have seven systems that I have access to. Um, and on the system tabs, I see a whole lot more systems that I don't have access to. So I can filter by the systems that I have access to. And we see that Manila is online, Santiago is paused. So we'll try Manila, see if it will run. Let's go back to the quantum lab. Uh, Omar, while it's loading, uh, we have a question on the Q&A. I, I would like to answer it live. Yes, please. Uh, Vincent is having some problems with the quantum circuit simulator. Uh, I, I, I guess from his question that he that Vincent is trying to use the quantum circuit to to as a uh, object instead of a message. So uh, that may, that may be the reason that you are not able to to load anything because the quantum circuit and the simulator are not objects, but they are messages that you sent to the OCH dot micro object object. Correct. So, so you can see you can see the difference. An object box is like dark, but has a, a bottom and a top line, a gray line, and a message box is all dark. This is a message. This is an object box. A message is just a message. An object is kind of a, a function. Thank you. All right, moving windows around. All right, so now I've checked. Hopefully this code is correct. And let's see what happens. Okay, so there's the little asterisk. It means that it's uh, running. 
and it is running supposedly and while it is running um we can there's a way to check on what happened to my job my execution um oh it says job sent to manila here so there's a button here on the left side that says pending november 19th 11 25 a.m that's the job that i just sent and there's a status timeline it says it was created at this time it was transpiled that means it was uh translated into into uh, known gates for this quantum uh, uh hardware specifically it validated took 990 milliseconds to validate and now it's in a queue so um even though we are offered um, uh, uh, ac free access uh, to these machines, which is beyond what I could, what anyone could have uh, dreamed of eight years ago, <laughs> uh, or e even less than that, five years, because these machines were online and started to become online in 2016. Um, we it, the the access to these machines is shared um, with ev everyone. So we need to be when we send a, a job to these machines, it's it sits in a queue. And right now, this new version of the quantum lab also says that it's expected to run in twenty three minutes. All right. So hopefully we'll uh, see some results before the end of uh, this tutorial session. I will come back to this uh, uh, in a while just going to close it for now and going to back going to be back to my presentation here so you i've shown you all these things and you might be thinking right now um you know tomato tomato potato potato where are my seeds i mean i i, I came here to for for the quantum computer music i want to do some sound with this uh, with <laughs> with this quantum circuits and to that, I have to say, uh, worry not, my young Padwan, everything in good time. And uh, what a good time it is right now. Um, so we should definitely uh, do something that is a little bit more musical with these uh, quantum circuits. All right. And to do that, I'm going to have, let me set up a challenge. It's good to have a challenge. And I'm <laughs> going to pull up my notes here on the side. Well, no one saw it. <laughs> Um, so let's see, let's say I have, I want to use a uh, quantum circuit to play an audio sample. And not just to play an audio sample per se, but I want to play sections of that audio sample. Um, let's say I want to play half Half, the first half of the audio sample, and then the second half of the audio sample. So what, I, what do I need? What is my problem? What, what do I need to, 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 to um, have the outputs? I need two numbers, right? Like z it can be zero for the first half and one for the second half. Um, and uh, we can have, we've seen one of the first quantum, quantum circuits that we've built with the IBM Quantum Composer it was just doing that in a very fun way using a simple Hadamard gate. So let's do that. All right, let's use the MicroKeys kit. Correct. Let's clean the console. Now, message box, we got this. Uh, QC, we just need one qubit and one classical bit. Yes. Um, but let me just do everything in one single message. So we need one Adamart gate on qubit zero. We need one measure gate between qubit zero and classical bit zero. And we will also need a simulator, simulator. Uh, we'll name it sim, pass it QC, and we just need one execution at a time, really. So let's set this up. There, everything is created. And in order to retrieve the counts, we call sim get counts, right? I'm gonna even make this object a little bit bigger. So this is our object that we will be interacting with. Let's say we'll click it and we, have, we see on the console, sometimes it's zero, sometimes it's one. It says counts for one, bit, that means bit string one and counts for zero, that means bit string zero. 
it in one shot that one shot was zero or in this case that one shot was one all right great so we need that zero and one how do we retrieve that uh from this och of micro object we can use the route counts let's see what comes out of that we have a list uh well a symbol that contains a list so in order for us to retrieve the contents of a symbol we can use the from symbol object let's connect these two together and here now we have an actual list so we can retrieve the first item of that list by using uh our message box the message box is like a really really powerful uh um object here or kind of special kind of object yes but a real powerful uh, tool here in max so i'm, I'm going to use the message box just to retrieve the first item of this message and i'm going to use another message box to print it so the, me <laughs> the message box is like the poor man's print and it, it's an all doer it does uh wonders all right so now i have the one now i have just the zero this is what we need all right so we have our quantum part. Now we need to connect this in a meaningful way to our musical part. First things first, we need an audio sample. Let's use some sample that comes with Max. Uh, let's see. Uh, can, you, can you hear that, the cymbal? Yeah. The clarinet? Thank you. I would say we we should select a sample that has like a huge double bass. Yes, or maybe a drum loop. That would be better. Yeah, that one sounds great. We can loop this uh, this sample, um, and it it has a clear first half and second half. Okay, great. Um, we could drag the sample here and and use this uh what is it called play playlist object but we're going to do real old school max way of, of of programming with with samples so we will create a buffer tilde object and we give it a name sample 1 and now we can drag if actually if we double lock the patch and double click it what it's open. Okay, we can uh, click and drag our sample into there. So now we replaced whatever was in there with our new sample. Great. Oh, I know why. Because I have something else with sample one name. I better change this sample underscore one. All right, perfect. So now it's empty. I click and drag the jungly sample there. I double click and it has the contents. Perfect. I need to know um, how long this sample is, right? And I need to play this sample. So in order to play a sample, we can use several different objects, but I'm gonna use the play till the object. And we refer to the buffer name, which is sample one. If we double click it, it's um, it has the, the contents and We'll use the easy, easy DAC, connect the patch cards. So ready on. And then uh, how do we start something? Again, you don't have to memorize everything. We can just always uh, open the, the help file and, uh, and see how to interact with it. And uh, surprise, surprise, the help file is a max patch in itself. So you can actually unlock it and start copying things. <laughs> um, well, here, Con command V, yes. All right, so we have this message and it says start at 500 milliseconds in. If I want to start at the, at the beginning, I'll just say start zero. Sorry if it, that was too loud. Let me know if this is better. All right. If I want to start 100, uh, 1,000 milliseconds in, then we, we are starting later. But I want to start exactly at the midpoint. So I need to know how long is this sample. And I can use the info tilde 
give it the name of the buffer that we are referring to, and it has a whole lot of uh, outlets. So the one that I'm concerned with is total time in milliseconds. Let's see here. And in order for it to do something, we need to say, go, do, do your thing. So we can connect a bang, and now we have the exact duration in uh, milliseconds of our sample. All right, so if we want to have uh, this sample to start at half point, we can divide that number by two. And again, uh, or we're just gonna use the message box as a poor man sprint and gonna send it to this message because there's something coming in. We use that as our uh, variable and set a placeholder in our message box. And when we send this, it started, it's cal calculated the sample duration divided by two sent here and said start at halfway through. All right, so we're almost there. Let's see. Um, we actually want to either play from the beginning up to halfway or from halfway through until the end. So, and we need to control that with this quantum circuit that is only saying uh, zero or one. All right, in order to do that, we need to do some math and we need to send this number that is that we're retrieving here to two different places, all right? Sending something to two different places. I know just the object for that. It's the trigger object. And I'm gonna just make sure that I'm sending integers. So I'm gonna type II, which is a short a shorthand for integer, integer. So I'm gonna send this integer that we're receiving here to two places. Again, first on the right and then on the left. Um, what we're going to do on the on, on the left is actually multiply it by uh, a number zero for now, and it will say uh, either. So I'm going to use the sim the simulator. It's one times zero is zero. It's a zero times zero is zero. So we need to replace the zero with uh, that number. We can do that by connecting the right inlet to the outlet of the, that object. So if we send this again, let's stop this here. We now change that value to that value. So if we send this, it's zero, but if it's one, it starts at halfway through. Okay, so this is part of it starts halfway through, starts at the beginning, but it plays everything. So I need to set the end point. And we can do that by adding a second placeholder. So what we'll be sending here is a list of two values. And we can pack two values together with um, the pack uh, object. So let's see, the first will be either zero or 14, 10, dot eight, seven, et cetera. And the other will be 14, 10, 87, et cetera, or 28, 21, et cetera. So what we actually need to do is offset this number that, that is zero or one to be one or two, right? So let's do just that. Let's add one to that number coming in here and then do the exact same thing, duplicate this. You can. Uh, hold Alt or Option to in click and drag to create a copy of an object or do Command D to duplicate an object. And now we need to change that zero by this number that we calculated here. And we should be getting the correct message now. I'm going to print it first on poor man's print object message box first, just to make sure everything's all right. Okay. Uh, something is not, let's see. Oh, we didn't send this number yet. So we need to bang it. Now it's replaced that number. Now from zero to zero and 1410 or 1410 and 2827, uh, 20, 2821 dot, etc. These are, this is a list of two numbers, two floating point numbers. And that should be what we need to 
get our project going. That was the first half. That was the second half. Okay. That's a little bit biased right now. All right. So I want I want the this patch. It's a little bit um, boring to be clicking this message uh, all the time. So I want to create uh, a way to send this um, automatically. And I'm going to use a metro. And the metro object, the way it works is that you can set a time interval and you'll set it on or off with a message one or, or zero. I'm going to use a toggle for that. And then it will bang every X milliseconds. Right now it's every 500 milliseconds. What I want to do is say, okay, so if the duration of, uh, of this uh, perf little performance here is this much, then we can say after this amount of time, just run the simulation again and see if we get the first half or the second half. All right, great. Uh, this is this is sounding pretty cool, but it's rather limited. So what I would like to do is add some complexity to it, and namely to our quantum part, which is now just using one qubit. Um, let me try to put things a little bit more neat here, uh, move some things around. Let's bring that over here. Get some real estate here. So what I what I really like now is to add some more complexity and in, in, in mainly by adding more qubits. So let's just have uh, an integer uh, a number box and uh, int box that you can also get from here. The shortcut is i, and we'll use that to determine the number of qubits. Mm -hmm. Let me bring this. Uh, I'm just going to create a new message again because that one's way too big. We don't, whoop, here we go. I made a mistake. I created an object box and uh, that's uh, incorrect. I wanted an M message box here. Let me get rid of that. So we need, we don't need that big of a message box there. Bring this over here, get some space there. All right. All right, so we need to focus on this part of the patch, which will be able to programmatically generate quantum circuits of uh, unknown number of qubits. This is quite the challenge, I, I would say. And all we want to control is, is it playing, is it not, and how many qubits are we using? All right, so we need to send this uh, number to several different places. and. In order to do that, uh, we're going to use the trigger object. All right, T I I I I I, because we're going to send it to um, many different places. One of the things that we need to do is um, create a quantum circuit, but we're going to go one step further even. And let me actually just move this out of the way. Now, much better. Okay, well, I deleted something. Anyway. Um, we're going to use some arguments here on the OCH micro keys so that it can make the process a little bit faster for us. And if we, we add a space there, you can see that it has some uh, optional positional arguments. So it can start, we can start the object with already a quantum circuit pre-built into. So we can give it a name. Let's name it QC. We, we can give it number of qubits for right now, uh, one and one, a simulator name. Uh, number of shots, just one, and sim auto update. We're, we're going to use one. There is a, let's see what it says on the reference sim auto update. When set to one, enable simulator auto update mode. Make simulator auto update when their assigned circuits change. Um, all right. So by default, what happens is that when you create the simulator and you pass it a circuit, it 
holds that circuit at that point in time. Um, but I've created a feature here in OCH at MicroKeyskit that makes the simulator uh, keep an eye on the on the quantum circuit that that it was fed, and if that quantum circuit changes, um, it's able to to update the simulator configuration automatically. Um, and so we're going to take advantage of that because we're going to be changing the, our quantum circuit quite a lot. And so we start by creating a quantum circuit. We use QC since it's the uh, quantum circuit we pass to the simulator. And we don't know what is the number of qubits uh, or the number of classical bits, but we know it's the same number. All right. So with the number that we send here, we're going to create autom automatically create, programmatically create a quantum circuit with that number of qubits and classical bits. But now we need uh, what's the second biggest part, an Adamart gate. Um, and it's going to be a lot of messages uh, to generate with, uh, with a higher number. So fortunately, there's some utility tools that, uh, as you can explore here on the overview patch, I've built some utility tools to help uh, ease the process of creating quantum circuits. And one of them is set, which creates, generates a series of micro gate H gate instructions, yada, yada. And arguments is the quantum circuit name. It's uh, QC in our case. Just to have an idea of how it works, let's print to the console and see what it does if I send it a number, uh, let's say whoop, two. So it, print, it sends out a message QCH0 and QCH1. All right, so it generates two atom markers for two qubits. And if I send three, it sends H0, H1, H2. That's perfect, that's all we need. It makes our life much easier. And so we're gonna use it here. Again, remember the order of output is right to left. So first we create the, 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 the quantum circuit with the number of qubits. Then we create the, uh, we add the quantum gates, the Adamart gates, and now we need the measurement gates. And fortunately, there is also uh, M set uh, abstraction that will make our life easier in this regard as well. All right, let's connect everything. And this part should be good. Let's see what happens. Let's disconnect this number here for, us for a moment and just see what comes out of here. We're gonna send one. So a one uh, qubit circuit, if we call the get counts, we have uh, bit string zero, bit string one with one uh, shot. But if we have two uh, qubits, now uh, if we simulate it, we might get, um, let's see, Let's print at this point rather here. We might see for one one, we have one shot, or for zero zero, we have one shot. So now our num total number of possible states of possible outputs will grow exponentially. And this is where you can start to get a feeling for how um, quantum computing is 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 it's completely <laughs> different and it's, it gets so much harder to to work with as we grow in uh, uh the number of, of qubits that we want to use in our system and and the complexity of our problems so here just by uh, uh curiosity if it's three qubits now we have the bit string zero one zero and we retrieve that one okay great that's good but what we we'll be retrieving from here is the first part of this list, which is a bit string, which is in binary. So we need to actually transform something that is uh, binary into something that is decimal so that we can say, um, use the, uh, if it's four different possible states, use the first quarter, the second quarter, the third quarter, or the last quarter of the sample. And we can do that by uh, using yet another utility that I've created um, that is bit string, binary string to, um, to decimal. All right, it's starting to get a little bit crowded here. Sounds good. Let's 
double check that it is what we want. I'm not going to send it to pack just yet. Let's see. Five, four, seven. That is correct. Uh, five. All right, great. If we have three qubits, we actually have eight possible states from zero to seven. So we need to calculate that. Given a number of qubits, how many possible states can we have? So that we know how many times we need to divide the sample, um, uh, the sample dur duration. So let's bring these guys a little bit closer now that we're ready for them. Move this to the side and see. We're retrieving that number there. So we're going to actually need to send it to two places. And we actually need to send to one place, but then we need to trigger an action. And you're going to uh, probably can guess already what is the action that we need to trigger after we set up that. It's something that has been quite annoying. It's this info sample we need to bang it every time. We're going to do that automatically for us. So we have the number of qubits. If we want to have the number of states, we can do the math or we can use a utility that I've also built that just converts qubits to states. Um, and so again, let's just preview what happens here. I lock the patch. I say one for one qubit, we can have two possible uh, outputs, zero or, or one. For two qubits, we can have four possible outputs, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. For three, it's eight, etc. And so we need to divide our sample by that number, right? And we, so we replace that number two with that number that we retrieved there. And then uh, we ask our info sample to make the calculation again. Just bang whatever the information is for this buffer. That, that's the duration. Divide that by that number and send that number to all the places that we need to send. So uh, if everything is correct uh, and I lock the patch, I can set one qubit for our circuit and set the metro on. Okay, so it plays the first half of the second half, or now we divide it in, uh, by four. And we can now play around with our pads just by controlling the number of qubits. All right, um, let's see how is everyone doing. Uh, I'm gonna stop it here. And uh, I see some messages. Paulo, do you wanna uh, let me know how uh, things well, are we, going? Well, we haven't had uh, any Q&A questions for a while. So okay. we might as well as uh, invite people to if you have any doubts, this is a good time to, to ask Omar after this brilliant uh, first section of the tutorial. Uh, yes. And we are actually over with this part. We didn't, it's almost noon. So we will uh, be back actually tomorrow. First thing tomorrow, we'll be going uh, uh, presenting the UDP CASM. Uh, which is a collaboration between me and Paulo here at Qtune, uh, a wonderful work uh, that we've we've done. They, you, you're going to be excited about it. It's going to be great. Um, I think we should end now. Uh, it's five past. Uh, if anyone has uh, okay. any questions. Do you want to turn on the camera? Yes, let's do that. Let me okay. stop the screen share and... Can you pin my camera, please? I'm going to turn on this camera here. And your camera as well, please. <laughs> I don't want to be alone in this uh, Zoom uh, space.
gonna add Carmen as well. Maybe yeah. anyone else that wants to join in that is on the on the Zoom right now. Yeah. Okay. I see Vincent asking somehow the object quantum circuit and simulator are not recognized after installing QC package. Again, quantum circuit and simulator are not objects, they are messages. So I'll make sure to double check that. And if anything, if OCH of micro kit is not recognized, no. then it's because the max um, database uh, didn't uh, refresh. So uh, a good hold, turn off and turn back on might be just good enough to fix that. Omar, have a okay. look in the Q&A section rather than the chat. There's some oh, questions yeah. that just come in fresh. Oh, a very okay. nice question from Kyle. It's an important one. Did your job on the quantum computer finish on the, oh, the actual yes. hardware? Guys, I totally <laughs> we forgot. We left it there just cooking. God. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Let's see what happened to that job. Where are you? Let me bring this closer. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Ha uh ha. -huh. We had 455 uh, shots returning 00, zero but we had 504 returning 11, one, but we also had 34 returning 01 and 31 returning 10. Huh, interesting. So this might give give us a, a um, introduce something that is that is good to have in mind, which is the current generation of real quantum hardware um, is uh, prone to noise. And noise is not noise as in music, but noise as in the atmos uh, atmospheric noise. And, and uh, they're really sensitive machines and they need to be in a very controlled environment, but yet they still, they still sometimes return uh, um, uh, incorrect results. But it's something that uh, IBM has been doing a great job in, in improving every next generation. Uh, and I believe probably Manila is not the latest generation of machines. Carmen might, might correct me on this. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, uh, thank you for, for asking, uh, for reminding that. This is actually something that's really beautiful and it shows you that you know, you're know you actually working with a real machine. So you're doing experiments in a machine that's sitting in Poughkeepsie in the US and you're sending it instructions. Um, so this, is, uh, this week we were announcing about how we have systems that have much smaller error rates. And there are also things you can do in your algorithms to reduce that, right? Um, but yeah, this is, this is kind of proof. It's the real stuff that you're using. Exactly. Actually, that's that's a good point. This is actually proof that it's the real stuff. <laughs> Omar, regarding what you just said about the generation, so that people know, uh, people can check uh, the generation on on the processor type. If you go to uh, in the IBM Quantum Services you go to the uh, place where it says services and there you go to systems and you can check the information for each of the backends. So there you have the, the answer. And as you guessed, it's not the latest one, which is Eagle that was announced like two days ago. So, <clears throat> Okay, we might have time for one last question live and then we can answer the, the rest uh, on the in text, right? So there is an interesting question uh, here. Just a second. Okay, what practical application does this have over using standard samplers and DAWs such as Ableton Live? Or is it more about advancing computer generated music? It's That's a more great like question. A, a, a philosophical question about yes, really how but a really per pertinent techniques. one. Um, and uh, as you will see in the rest of the symposium, you'll have uh, different answers to this question. So um, the answer that I can offer right now, um, based on my own research, is that um, doing this work, integrating quantum computing in 
my creative practice. I'll speak uh, from from even my my own creative practice uh, point of view has enabled me to think differently about the compositional process itself. It's doing calculations, it's using the computer as an assistant to the composition, um, but it's using a different set of logical uh, instructions. And by rethinking my problem in a way that makes sense to be uh, computed by a quantum computer, I'm also rethinking my, my, own, my own questions. So for me, that's, that, that, that in itself is a tremendously valuable uh, advantage <laughs> or, or, or benefits that quantum computing brings to my, my creative practice. But um, there are, uh, in, in, in abstracts, there are uh, 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 theoretical advantages to running certain uh, algorithms and, and trying to solve certain problems using quantum computers. And that in itself is like the main challenge for the entire community of quantum computing researchers worldwide. They're trying to, uh, on the one hand, find good algorithms to, to implement uh, on, on quantum computers and B, improve the current generations of, of quantum computers that we have so that they have uh, less noise and be able to deliver more accurate answers. <laughs>